fired up already even in the prayer just knowing what we're going to be preaching about this morning. I don't know if you've heard in the news or not, but just this week there was a man that's been arrested in Colorado Springs for shooting up a Planned Parenthood. Now, I'm going to state this right from the beginning just so there's no confusion and you know when this sermon goes online people aren't trying to rip my words out of context and I have a whole section dedicated to this. I do not believe it is our job to take up arms and to start righting every wrong and start executing judgment upon people, even if it's deserved. That is not our job, and I'm going to show you from the Bible, okay? However, if you want me to shed a tear or to be sad because, and, and look, I don't know all the details of this, so I'm just using this as an example because it's up in the news, but I know prior to that there was, there was an abortion doctor that was killed in a church. Look, if you want me to shed a tear for that person, I'm not going to because you know what? That person's a monster. That person is, is a murderer who go, is going around and makes a living off of killing innocent little children in the womb. I am not upset or saddened by this. But you know what? We live in a sick and twisted and perverted world that's going to take an event. Now look, again, I'm not speaking necessarily specifically because I don't know all the details of that situation. I didn't hear everything. I don't know who got shot, who got hurt. I don't know if the guy's just some total nut job that's just a man, you know, whatever. I don't know anything about it. I'm not endorsing that guy. But... The wickedness that is going on in those Planned Parenthood places, you, you have to be able to expect that something like that is going to happen. Look, if he doesn't do it, someone else probably will. It's going to be God's judgment that comes upon them, and we'll see that as well. But I want, I, I've got a few quotes from an article that I read, and this just blew me away. I mean, this is what's being pumped at you from the minute you say, oh, you know, like, I, I, look, I don't believe in watching TV and movies and all this other stuff that comes out of Hollywood because I think it's just full of lies and I think they're blasphemous against our Lord Jesus Christ and I don't want to have any of that brainwashing me into thinking that that stuff's okay. They use the media, the music, the, the, the movies to try to desensitize you to sin. They, they, they put all the sin in front of your face to try to make you think it's not that bad. That's a big goal out in Hollywood and in the entertainment industry over larger. You say, well, I don't watch it. I just watch the news. Well, listen, my friend, the news is going to warp your view on things also. Now, I pay attention to news, but just be aware and be careful of what is being put in front of you and know that there's always an agenda and everything that you see on TV is a lie and that there are a lot of, you know, the, the media in general is extremely liberal and is going to show you their view of things. Here's an idea of what their view is. This is why I'm going on this little rant. This is our, a quote from the, uh, the Attorney General for the United States. You know, it used to be Eric Holder until they couldn't cover up his crimes anymore. And now they've got this Loretta Lynch is the Attorney General for the United States. This is a quote that I got from this article that she said regarding this shooting in, in Planned Parenthood. She said, this unconscionable attack, listen to this, was not only a crime against the Colorado Springs community, but a crime against women receiving health care services at Planned Parenthood. Law enforcement seeking to protect and serve and other innocent people. Now, I'm sorry, Loretta, but you're going to paint this as, oh, Planned Parenthood, they're just, it's just health care. Oh, they're just, they're just going down to get a Tylenol. They're just going down to get a checkup. Or get, look, look, Planned Parenthood is a wicked organization. That's a murder organization. This, in this, this specific Planned Parenthood, they perform abortions. They perform murders. And no matter how you slice it, look, it's a murder. They kill innocent children. Now, why is it all of a sudden it's just acceptable because it's passed into law? Oh, this is, this is okay. Now it's just morally acceptable to go in and chop up a baby in the womb and just say, that's, that's fine. It's, and we call it an abortion. We call it another name. We'll just say, oh, it's an unwanted pregnancy. No, it's a baby. It's a live person inside of that womb. And you're trying to say that this is okay? And if you're talking about, oh, innocent people getting hurt, what about the innocent people getting hurt inside that Planned Parenthood? The ones that don't have a voice, the ones that can't defend themselves, that are being brutally murdered on a daily basis. You want to talk about tragedies, it's not the few people that were killed in this shooting. 
It's the millions of babies that are being killed every year in this country. I've got some statistics for you. I meant to highlight these. Here's abortion statistics since Roe v. Wade passed in 1973. This is only counting legal, documented abortions in the United States. 57 million people over 57 million. You want to you wanna cry over the 3,000 souls? Look, hey, the, the World Trade Center? Yeah, that's a tragedy. You, Paris? Yeah, that's a tragedy. Look, there are people being, being, being killed. We're talking about 57 million people that don't have a voice, that can't stand up for themselves, that are just being slaughtered. People get upset over the, the Jewish Holocaust. Where, where supposedly 6 million Jews died in World War II, which I don't believe that number anyways, we're talking 57 million people. Babies. Babies. We've got a two-month-old here in the front row. I can't think of a person on this planet that would be, that would be okay with some, someone coming in and chopping his head off right now. Everybody would be up in arms about it. Everybody would think it's probably one of the worst things that could ever happen in the whole world for someone to come in. But what if you called that person a doctor? And what if we just rewind four months? Now all of a sudden it's perfectly acceptable, right? The same human being, Jonathan Burson, the same person, the same live person, four months ago would have been completely fine to just exterminate his life. Or wait, oh, six months ago. Oh, seven months ago, right? Put on whatever date they want to put on and say, oh, well, you can't have abortions after this date because we're just making up an arbitrary number and saying it's a person after this date, which they won't even do that. We're going to see from the Bible all the, the evidence that you need. If you're a Christian today, if you, if you claim to believe God's word, I better not hear once out of your lips that you think abortion's just fine no matter what the circumstance, no matter, no matter how early it is. I don't care when it is. I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that, that a person becomes a person at conception. The moment that that child is conceived, they are a human being, they are conceived in the womb, and they are alive, and they are a child at that point. And if you go and intentionally try to abort that child or kill that child, it is a wicked sin and you are not right with God. And it's a serious wicked sin. Now look, you may have previously had an abortion or, or you might know someone has had an abortion and there's no way to say this lightly because it is a grievous sin. And if you haven't already, you ought to repent. Now look, I understand the culture we live in today, and there's a lot of young girls, there's teenage girls that, that, that don't have any wisdom. They're not being taught right from wrong. They're getting pushed into these abortion clinics and being told, oh yeah, this is fine. You know, you can't have this right now. We'll just take care of this. It's not a big deal. It's just this procedure. And they don't have the wisdom or the knowledge, even understanding, knowing that there's like literally this child inside their womb. And they get pushed in by their parents or by friends or by counselors or whoever to go get these things done. And then it's screws them up later in life yep. because they, they, they finally realize what they actually had done. I know there are a lot of people, and hey, the statistics say, I can't remember what it was, I read one, and I don't know if it's in this one or not, by the age of 45, one in three women will have had an abortion. One in three. One in three! One out of three women will have an abortion by the time they're 45. What kind of perverted world do we live in? Legalized first degree murder. That's it. It's first degree murder has been legalized. And you know what? The reason is because this isn't being preached as loudly as it ought to be. This isn't being, being railed against. You know, there, there's, there's a complete lack of wisdom going on here. And, and if this is, you know... I'm getting ahead of myself here. There was another statistic that I saw, and again, I, I, I forgot to highlight, I meant to highlight where all the, because I don't want to spend the, the, the time this morning just reading through this little article. I'll just leave this up here for you. You can check out the statistics for yourself. It was something like 200, roughly 200 out of every 1,000 births end in abortion. So like, um, the number here, I think they weren't counting stillbirth. So, so between the ratio for, uh, here it is, 
The number of abortions per 100 pregnancies that end in either abortion or live birth. So this statistic that they're giving, they're not including miscarriages or stillbirths. They're not including those numbers in their, in their statistics. So people who are going to have a, a, a pregnancy to full term, right, that would normally have had a pregnancy to full term, that's not some miscarriage, it's not, it's not a stillbirth, right? Versus abortions, it says this number is significant since it tells us the likelihood that any given pregnant woman will choose to abort or give birth to her baby. Like the rate in the raw numbers, the abortion ratio rose, so it's saying it rose and then it dropped, and it's at 21.2 in 2011 out of 100. One out of five. 20%. 20% of pregnancies that would go full term, people are aborting. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of children being slaughtered. You want to get upset about something, get upset about that. And, you know, I'm not condoning the actions of going out and taking the law into your own hands. But I do believe that the abortion doctors need to be put to death. I do believe that the death penalty is a righteous judgment for them. It ought to be against the law. It ought to be carried out in a court of law. They ought to have a trial. They ought to have due process. And when they're found guilty of murdering babies, they ought to be put to death. That's what they deserve. So when someone comes in and shoots an abortion doctor, I'm not sad about it. Justice, I believe, has been carried out, but it's not the proper way and it's not the way that we need to be go about doing things. We don't just live in a completely lawless society where everyone just takes the law into their own hands. But I'm not going to be sad about it either. To me, it's just one less murderer on the streets. The, the chief executive of Planned Parenthood of the Rocky Mountains, Vicki Cohort, said in a statement that the media reports showed that witnesses confirmed that Deere was motivated by opposition to abortion. It says, and she says, she's quoted as saying this, this is an appalling act of violence targeting access to health care and terrorizing skilled and dedicated health care professionals. Do you see the double speak? Instead of saying violence targeted against people getting abortions and murdering babies, it's against people, oh, getting access to health care, as if you were just to go to a doctor because you have a cold. That's the way they want you to think about this. And terrorizing, right? Oh, you're such a, you're a terrorist. You're terrorizing skilled and dedicated healthcare professionals. That's like calling Jeffrey Dahmer a healthcare professional. Oh, yeah, he was skilled, all right. He knew how to chop up his victims and put them in the freezer and cook them up real good. And he was a psychopath. And why don't you use these same words against him? Because I'll tell you what, the abortion doctor, that skilled and dedicated professional, we're going, to make, we're going to make his actions sound so much better by calling him a professional and using adjectives to describe somebody to make them fit into this society that what they're doing is not actually a monstrous act. This is what, and this is what this article was all about that I read. It was like on Yahoo or something. And you're going to be pumped with this type of rhetoric. We're going to, oh yeah, that's terrible. Oh, you know what? No. Why doesn't somebody come out and just call them what they really are? They're vile murderers that, that I mean, it's, it's the lowest of the low. They're not even just a murderer that, that, that somebody, you know, gets, you know, they get in a fight or you kill somebody that's an adult and like you can fight back and you have an opportunity. They're murdering babies before they ever even have a chance, before they even take their first breath of life. They're murdering babies. We started off reading in Exodus chapter 21. Keep your marker here. We're going to go back to that because Exodus 21 goes over quite a few laws that God has prescribed that ought to be the law of the land. He, he gave the children, he said, look, this is how you ought to set things up. This is my law. 
And when people break, you know, this is the way that when you have these situations arise, when this comes up, when you have this situation, you know, in that, in that chapter it talks about a man and he has an ox and the ox kills somebody. He said, this is how you deal with it. This is righteous judgment. If that person had an ox and he was, you know, he was going around and, and you can tell he was being dangerous and he didn't do the proper measures to try to keep people safe from him, hey, then that person's going to be held responsible because a death is a big deal. When someone loses their life, hey, it's a big deal. We get even desensitized to death these days. You hear about it all the time in the news and until it happens to you and hits close to home, you don't even think about it. It's just a number. It's just a name. It's nothing. These people that you know we, we see about even with the, the police brutality cases and stuff and it's like these, a lot of these people and look, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with, with all these or any of these there's a lot of, a lot of a little abuse that's rampant in the police departments these days and a lot of force that they're being trained to use that is, that is completely unacceptable. And you can say, you know, people get, get up on their high horse and say, oh, well, you know, when they called him to him, instead of, instead of walking this way, he should have walked this way. Does that mean he should lose his life? I mean, think about that. If that was your brother or your uncle, I mean, they're just not alive anymore. They're gone. You don't get that person back. Is that a mistake that's worthy of that person just completely not allowing to live anymore? I'm not talking about situations where you could legitimately say, hey, look, this person feared for their safety and they shot him because they came and attacked him. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about cops when you have 20 of them all surrounding, say, like a homeless man, like the Kelly, Kelly Thomas. Right? What was he doing? Supposedly he was breaking into some cars. Was he? Probably. I don't know. I mean, he was kind of, he had schizophrenia or whatever. He was, he was, he was kind of messed up. But they had the guy, they beat him to a bloody pulp. And he was crying for his daddy. Saying, Daddy, help me. Help me. As they beat him with their fists to death. The guy literally died in a hospital. This is the stuff that's unacceptable. But that person, he's gone now. He's gone. We write it about in the news. Yeah, well, it came and passed through the news, right? But for, the, for, that, for that person's father, that impacted him for the rest of his life. When somebody dies, it's a big deal. And God treats it as such. Murder is a big deal. You're in, um, I had you, you know, keep your marker in Exodus 21. We're coming right back to that. Numbers 35, verse 30. If you want to turn there, Numbers 35, basically this is what prescribes the, the, the punishment for someone who's a murderer. Numbers 35, 30 says, Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. So God says, look, the murderer, when somebody is convicted and found guilty, and it's not just one person's word against another, you have enough evidence. There's multiple witnesses that say, yes, I saw this. This person commit this crime. He killed that person in cold blood. You know, the, the due process is taking place. It happens before judges. They present the case. They say, okay. That person deserves a death penalty because they're a murderer. And, and what it says here, you shall take no satisfaction. That word satisfaction means there's no other payment that you should make. You cannot say, oh, well, this person who killed that person, he's rich. And he's just going to pay the family a million dollars just so that he can avoid, you know, he's, he's going to pay a financial debt instead of the death penalty. God says no. God says, nope, there's no amount of money. There's nothing else you can do. You can't give up all of your property and all of your goods for you to stay alive. You killed somebody else. You're a murderer. You're being put to death. That is the righteous judgment. Back where we were in Exodus chapter 21, this is relevant to what I'm talking about with abortion. And this is important. Look at verse number 22 of Exodus 21. The Bible reads, if men strive, and there when it says men striving, it means they're fighting. And it's talking about a physical fight, not an argument. If men, are str if men strive, they're fighting, and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. What this is saying is that if there's two guys fighting, 
right? And there's a, there's a woman that's pregnant nearby, and somehow they fight and they knock into her, and, and, and the baby ends up dying as a result of that whole altercation. What he's saying is that if no mischief follow, means if it was unintentional. If the fighting was happening between these guys and, and, and it was more of an accident and you know they weren't trying to hurt her or kill the baby or anything like that, then there's a punishment, but it's basically, you know, the, the husband's going to say, you know, you, you owe me this and they're going to pay, the judges are going to determine what's allowed and there's going to be, there's going to be a settlement in that regard. But that's not a murder because that was accidental. There is a punishment for it, but, that's, but, but this is what's important. Look at what it says in verse 23. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. If it was intentional, if it was something where, you know, two guys are fighting, uh, you know, this, this a man and another man, and the man's wife is standing there, and this guy's, you know, beating on the husband, and then he goes and just like, what, you know, hurts the, the wife too and makes the baby die. Because he just, he hate, you know, either in the heat of the moment or whatever, he hates this guy so much he's going to make him pay by, by hurting his wife also and the child. Or how, however it works out, we're saying, if any, that's why it uses a broad term, if any mischief follow. If it gets found out that, yeah, he intended to do that. Well, now he's saying, well, you're a murderer. Even if you didn't kill the husband or the wife, when that baby dies, he said, you're giving life for life. Why? Because the Bible says that's a life. The, the child in the womb of the pregnant woman is alive. It's a life. And if somebody causes that child to die, you give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. It is every much a person as anybody else. So it says here in 20, verse 22, if men strive and hurt a woman with child. So now, because what you're going to find is you're going to have Christians trying to pick apart these words. Well, what, what does it mean to be with child, right? Maybe that means you're, you're 26 weeks along. Maybe that means you're 38 weeks along. Maybe, you know, what does it mean to be with child? When is it actually a child? You know, is it really a child? So we're going to cover that and we're going to, I'm going to prove it from the Bible, what it means. Bible uses these words with child. 2 Samuel 11.5 2 Samuel 11.5 is talking about when David commit adultery with Bathsheba. You remember that? David was supposed to be off to war. He stayed back. He, he, was, he was up on his roof. He saw Bathsheba. He gave in to his, to his lustful desires. And he laid with Uriah the Hittite's wife, Bathsheba. And she became pregnant. 2 Samuel 11.5, look what it says. It says, and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. As soon as she knew she conceived, she's saying she's with child. So don't tell me that being with child means that they have to be formed, they have to have a heartbeat, they have to have you know, other organs formed in their body in order to be considered a child. Right here in 2 Samuel 11, verse 5, the Bible says the woman conceived and sent and told David, I am with child. Conception is the first thing that happens. We're going to get into that in a minute too because there's some people who are trying to change the definition even of conception. But if that's not enough for you, how about this proof from the Bible? You can say, oh, well, that's just Bathsheba talking and she doesn't know. She's just using some terminology, but she's not really with child. That's stupid. But, but anyways, we've got, we've got a further proof. In uh, Matthew chapter 1, there's a reference to Isaiah 7. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, the Bible reads, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Sound familiar? Talking about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Talking about Mary being a virgin and, and, and being with child. The quote that they made from the Old Testament they quoted it in the New Testament. God decided to preserve his word and quote the Old Testament passage as, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. A virgin with child, right? Well, let's see what the quote is in Isaiah 7, 14. 
The Bible reads, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So when you compare the Bible with the Bible, in the New Testament it says a virgin shall be with child, and in the Old Testament it says a virgin shall conceive. Well, wait a minute, he's misquoting it. No, he's not. He's not misquoting it all because the two things are synonyms. They mean exactly the same thing. Conceiving and being with child is a biblical definition. That's what it means to be with child. It means you've conceived. And again, we, we live in such a sick world where people try as hard as they can to justify abortion. They'll say, well, wait a minute. Okay, well, then what's conception? And they're trying to change the definition of conception to be when, when the, the, not when the, the, the seed of the man and the egg of the woman come together, which is what it, historically the word is mean, conceive. That's, that's what it means. They're trying to change that now to when it implants on the uterus wall which could happen seven days after the actual conception because they're trying to buy themselves a little bit of time to get out of their pregnancy. But again, according to the Bible, that, that definition is not going to hold up. You could make up whatever definition for words you want and try to trick yourself that way, but it's just going to be a lie and it's not going to stand up to, to God's word. That's why in Hebrews 11:11 11, 11, the Bible says through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. Conception, see, you don't conceive seed when it implants. The the conceiving of the seed happens the moment the two come together. And that's the moment that life starts. That is the moment when and that's that's when the moment when a woman's even going to be able to tell that she's pregnant or anything, you know, that's that's when it happens. That's when that new life has begun. There's something that happens there that we are ignorant of, that we don't know how exactly it works, that, because God's the one creating that life. We have no way of knowing exactly how that happens, because God is the creator of life. And the biblical definition of someone being with child, having a baby, having a person, a real person, that... that can a person, another person can receive the death penalty for if that life is taken, is that conception. Now think about that because that's some serious consequences because you've been brought up in a society today that's going to tell you that no, 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 this is fine. This is, this is legal. This is good. We're, you, know, you don't want that pregnancy? Don't have it. You need to get an education. You need to get a job. You need to do all these other things with your life. You, 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 you. Focus on yourself. Again, another godless thought of just focusing on yourself instead of the Bible's, you know, esteem others better than yourself. Especially the, the, the young, the widows, the fatherless, right? God has a special place in his heart for all the people who have it bad in this life because of things like you're, they're, they're just born. I mean, think about a child who's fatherless, right? It's not his fault at all. The sins of his parents, you know, brought him into this world. But hey, this is, the, this is the, the hand he's been dealt, right? God has a special place in his heart for that person because they're innocent. The widows, right? A godly widow, someone who's you know, come to church, maybe their, their husband or their wife died a long time ago. Especially, especially a woman who's, who, you know, who had a husband that was providing for him and, and, and he's passed on through no fault of her own, right? I mean, that's the situation she's in. These are people who are weaker, who are more susceptible to be taken advantage of, and God looks on those people and says, you know, you better not take advantage of them. A baby, a helpless baby, God is very serious about, about that. We're going to get to that in a minute. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel 16. Because, you see, when we realize that a life begins at conception, all of a sudden, what does that do to your morning after pills? The women that want to go out and play the whore, and then the next day take the morning after pill, just say, oh, well, I won't get pregnant. I don't have to worry about it. And again, there's a lot of ignorance that goes on because they don't realize necessarily what they have. They just think, oh, well, I won't be able to have a baby. I won't even be able to get pregnant. No, what you're doing is you're causing the pregnancy to end. That's what the morning after pill, what it does is, look, by that time, you've probably already had the, the, the coming together of the, of the seed and the egg. 
And the conceptions could have already taken place. And what you do by taking the morning after pill is you're annihilating that life right away. You're causing the, the, the I don't want to get into detail about what it does to your body, but in, in a woman's reproductive place, it, it makes it hostile for that baby to survive. And you are killing that child. The morning after pills are just as much a murder as going in for an abortion one hour before the baby's delivered. It's just as much a murder. It's the same life. Whether you kill it right one second after it's conceived or whether you kill it one hour before it's born, a murder is a murder. And you're taking that life just as much of a murder as, as one day after a baby's born, right? What's, what's the difference between two hours before a baby's born and one hour after it's born or one day after it's born? Nothing. They're both still murder. It's the same person that God has created. Just because you can't see it, just because you can't feel it, doesn't make it any less real. And it's not just the morning after pills. Did you know that the morning after pills are nothing more than just high dosages of regular birth control pills? And the drugs that they put women on. And see, they go into these doctors and say, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Just take this pill. You need to regulate your, your cycle. You've got to do all this other stuff. You know, you need to be safe and, and just, just get on these pills. These birth control pills are causing abortions. That's what they do. Not only, you, know, you say, oh, no, 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 it prevents, it prevents the body from even producing the egg. Yeah, you know what, though? That doesn't happen 100% of the time. So all of these birth control pills, they are designed on multiple levels. It's not just, oh, the egg doesn't get produced. Because what happens is that's only so effective. So then what they do, because they try to make these things 99% you know, effective or 99.9%, .9%, whatever the percentage is that they claim to be effective in you not getting pregnant or not having a child. The way that they do that is not just in trying to control that egg being produced. It also then creates the hostile environment within, inside the womb so that if conception does take place, it's not going to be able to implant. And that's what's happening. So women are getting pregnant without even realizing it because they're on these pills. If they're if they doing that activity that, where this can happen, I don't, again, that's another statistic. I didn't look it up, but you can look up the statistics on that on how often that probably happens if somebody is having an a, a, uh, active lifestyle with, with someone of the opposite gender. If a woman is, is lying with a man while taking the pill, how often throughout the year they're having silent abortions, not even realizing it. Because for one, it, the doctor's not going to tell you that. And for two, most people are just ignorant. They don't even understand the way that this, these drugs work that you're putting into your system. Now, you may be doing these things through ignorance, but once you're confronted with the truth, you need to repent. If this is something that, you know, people listening to this online, look, if you didn't know this before, if you're someone who's done this before, hey, it's wrong and it's wicked. And like I said, there's no, there's no light way of saying that. It's a wicked sin. And I'm not going to back up on that just because someone's done it, even unintentionally. But the bottom line is you need to recognize it as such and you need to break your heart before God and, and, and get on your knees and, and, and cry unto the Lord and beg Him for mercy. And never do that again. Let's take a look at how God feels about children being killed. And also pay attention to the language that's used. Because, you know, fundamental Baptists get a bad rap sometimes saying, oh yeah, you know, you guys are just mean-spirited and everything else. And, you know, because, because of the way that we view sin. Right? When you talk about a woman whoring around and prostituting herself and just, and just playing a whore and then going and trying to fix her problem, her problem by getting an abortion. You know, they don't like you using that language. Well, let's look, at the Bible. let's look at the Bible's language. Let's look at the way God views things. Ezekiel 16, let's start reading in verse number 20. I want you to pay attention to how many times God uses the word whore. 
And it's a good word to use. You know why? Because it's a negative word. Because even in this society, they haven't taken that word and tried to change it into a positive or into something that's cool. Right? That's what the, the pop culture likes to take words that are negative and try to make them sound good and positive and cool. And oh yeah, that's a good thing. The word whore, no woman wants to be called a whore. That is not a pleasant word to, to, to use or to, or to have be said about you. And this is a word that the, the Bible uses quite a bit. And it needs to be used because women need to really think about this, that it's not just having fun. It's not just, oh, I love this person. No, it's you being a whore. Exodus 16, verse 20. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? So he's, saying, he's, he's talking about, he's saying, look, you've taken your sons and your daughters that you've borne unto me. Talking about they've borne unto God. He's saying, those are, those are like my children that, that you've borne. You've borne them unto me. And he says, you've sacrificed them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? That thou hast slain my children, you've killed my children, and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth when thou wast naked and bare and wast polluted in thy blood. He's saying, you've forgotten where you came from. Now, uh, look, just, just everything being said, he's talking to the nation of Israel here. He's, he's, he's making a bigger statement. Okay, I get that. This isn't just directed at abortions or something. This passage is not. But when we look at the language that's used and when we look at the words that are used, we, could, we can, I believe, completely apply this to how God is going to feel about innocent children being murdered because he brings up the fact. Now, in those days, what they were doing is they were, they were causing their children to pass through the fire. They were giving their children as a sacrifice unto false gods. That's what they were doing. But the concept is basically the same. Today we have, now it's not maybe using fire, although I can't imagine what the saline solution must feel like to the child that literally melts them. I mean, okay, you're not literally passing your child into a fire, but you're injecting a saline solution into your womb to, to destroy that child. I, I don't really see a big difference there. It's just modern technology. And instead of sacrificing it unto, a, unto a, a golden idol of a statue of that place, you're, you're, you're sacrificing unto the, the vanity of your own life, the idol of, of, of a vain life where you're just focused on yourself. But let's keep reading here. He's saying, you know, you don't remember when you were naked and bare and polluted in thy blood. Hey, you were weak at one point too. You were a little child too. But now all of a sudden you're growing up. And that's what these, you know, these globalists, they want, they want to reduce the world's population and stuff. Hey, why don't they start with themselves? If you think there ought to be, you know, they want to have all these abortions. You always want, you know, they always want other people to kill their children. What about themselves and their own children? Yeah, oh, no, 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 don't come after me. It's everybody else that needs to kill their children. That's what the loud mouths will say. That's what the liberals will say. Look, you kill, kill other people's children, not my own and not me. Hey, you weren't aborted. You're still alive. When you were weak and helpless, no one aborted you. Now you want to go and abort little children? Verse 23, And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God, that thou hast also built unto thee an eminent place and hast made thee an high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at, the, at every head of the way and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred. And listen to this, And hast opened thy feet to everyone that passed by and multiplied thy whoredoms. He's, again, he's referring to the nation of Israel as a woman that's just a whore that multiplies her whoredoms of just saying, I'll just spread my legs for anybody that walks by. Right? And this is a language that God's using against the nation, but look, it can apply to an actual event also because that's what whores do. And it's the, the whores that, that spread their legs for anybody instead of keeping it something that's supposed to be pure and holy and given only unto her husband. That's the reason why you find yourself in these situations of, of wanting to kill a baby to begin with. 
If you just keep your legs closed until you get married and do things God ways, then you, God's way, then you won't have a problem. Verse 26, Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Again, I mean, he's, he's, going, he's going on and on about their fornication, their whoredom. I'm going to keep reading because he keeps on using these words. Pay attention to that, how, how, how hard he's, be, you know, he's beating this into their heads of calling them a whore. Behold, therefore I have stretched out my hand over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd ways. Calling them lewd. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians because thou wast insatiable. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them and yet couldest not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing that thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, in that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thy high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband, they give gifts all whores, but thou givest thy gifts all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee. Therefore thou art contrary. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. And it keeps on going on. Look, it goes on and on. I'm going to get to the point because he still rails on them. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 36. Thus saith the Lord God, because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers and with all the idols of thy abominations and by the blood of thy children, which thou didst give unto them, behold, therefore I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure and all them that thou hast loved with all them that thou hast hated, I will even gather them round about against thee and will discover thy nakedness unto them that they may see all thy nakedness and I will judge thee as women that break wedlock and shed blood are judged and I will give thee blood in fury and jealousy. So verse 36, he's saying, because of your filthiness, because of your whoredom and because of the blood of your children. Those things are going hand in hand in this chapter. The blood of the children and the whoredoms. The whoredoms and the blood of the children. And he says, I'm going to judge thee. I'm going to judge you as a woman that breaks wedlock and shed blood are judged. And the judgment of an adulterer or an adulteress is someone that's to be put to death. That's the judgment. That's God's judgment upon them. And then he goes on, continuing on how he's going to... Uh, he says in verse 42, So will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet and will be angry no more. He goes on about, about the judgment that's going to come upon them as a nation, verse 39, 40, and 41, and, and just showing how serious he takes this matter. Abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. Turn, if you would, to um, 2 Kings chapter 24. Turn, if you would, to 2 Kings 24. We're almost done. I'm going to read for you for Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs 6.16 6, says, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. God hates people that shed innocent blood. God hates it. 2 Kings, you're going to 2 Kings 24. I'm going to give a little backdrop here. We're going to read a little bit about Manasseh. Manasseh was the wicked king right before the children of Israel were all just taken captive into Babylon. He was probably the most wicked king that, that the children of, of uh, Judah had. The kingdom of Judah, he reigned over them. In uh, 2 Kings 21, verse 16, the Bible reads, Moreover, Manasseh shed innocent blood very much, 
till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. So we see in, in chapter 21 that the Bible records Manasseh is shedding innocent blood very much. He says he filled up the land basically with the innocent blood that he shed. But you're in chapter 24, 2 Kings chapter 24. I want you to see this about the innocent blood that shed. Now look, this doesn't innocent blood doesn't necessarily have to be solely, you know, abortions. Okay, I get that too. So before people want to pull apart all of my words, innocent blood can, I mean, it's, you know, you're taking somebody's life that they don't deserve to die. That's someone who's innocent, right? But what I'm trying to point out is how much more innocent can you get than someone who hasn't even been born yet? That is innocent blood. And there's no way about it. Elizabeth, sit down in the front row right now. 2 Kings 24, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah, to remove them out of his sight, for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did, and also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. He said, God's not going to look over that. All of the innocent blood that you shed... Yeah, God said, I, I, I can't pardon that. I cannot do it. You know, you remember with uh, Cain and Abel, right? The, when um, Cain slew his brother Abel, God said, what did he say? He said, the blood of thy brother crieth out to me. Right? God, it, it's, it's, you know, an injustice was done. Cain was, uh, Abel was innocent. Innocent blood was shed when Cain killed him. And that blood cries out to God. Think about the 57 million. The blood of 57 million. Do you think God's going to pardon that? That's why this nation is going to be judged right there. The blood of those innocent children is crying out unto the Lord. We need to get right, people. We need to get down on our face, on our hands and our knees and beg God for mercy. And get right with the Lord. Reverse this, this legality of, of the, of the you know, murder of children. My last point though, is why I, point, well, why I need to make this clear, is that God is the one that revenges. Look, this angers me. It angers me that there's people out there that, that kill other people and, and, and murder innocent lives. It angers me. It saddens me. It's disgusting. It's depraved. It's immoral. But God will be the one that revenges. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 94. We're going to close with Psalm 94. I'm going to read for you from Exodus 22. Exodus 22, verse 22 says, Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. God says, you mess with the widow or the fatherless child. He said, if you afflict them, you, you cause any, any harm unto them and they cry unto me. The blood of those innocent children is crying unto the Lord. He's saying, I'm going to hear their cry. I will surely hear their cry. It's not going to get past God. And his wrath is going to wax hot. Uh, you know, how much it angers you Think about how much it angers you and how much do you suppose, if you're that angry, does that anger God? God's the one that gave them their life. You could, I mean, it makes me angry for the, for the nameless children of just lumped into one statistic here. It's a staggering number that you, that, that you I mean, you can't even get your mind around 57 million. I can't get my mind around that. I don't even know how much that is. That's a lot. That, that boggles my mind to try to comprehend how many people is 57 million. And that makes me angry, but how much more angry would you be if someone came and murdered your child? That's the anger that God feels. 
He's the one that created that life and you've taken it away. And there's multiple people complicit in that murder. The, the, the woman that goes down and allows the person to, 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 to perform the murder is, is just as much guilty. But you know what? That doctor, the, the doctor trained, the skilled and trained professional, right? That this world wants to call them and, and try to give them that respect of being in some type of a respectable position or profession. He's a mass murderer. Mass murderer. And this wicked government and society thinks it's okay. And they condone of it. Psalm 94. We're going to read this whole psalm and be done. Psalm 94, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth. O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. This is a prayer of David. It's a psalm. Yes, it's a song. But it's also a prayer of David unto God. Saying... God, vengeance belongs to you. You are the one that needs to revenge and right these wrongs. Show thyself. And I'll pray that today. God, show yourself. Bring vengeance upon these evildoers that are taking innocent blood, dear Lord. Verse 2, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. Render a reward to the proud. Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things? And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. You talk about murdering the fatherless. I mean, how many of these women that go in to get abortions are going in to have abortions because they're not married, because they committed fornication, and that there's not going to be a father to help take care of them and their child? How long, Lord, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. They're murdering the fatherless. Verse 7, yet they say, the Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. They don't care. They don't even believe there's a God these days. They say, oh yeah, God doesn't see. Yeah, yeah, whatever. It's, you know, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. Verse 8, understand ye brutish among the people and ye fools. When will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall not he correct? He that teacheth man knowledge shall not he know. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. <coughs> for the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within, my, within me, thy comforts delight my soul." Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law? Look at that. Do you remember, going back earlier in the sermon, when we read in Exodus 21, when a woman was with, when two men strive, and the woman is with child, what did it say? It said, if no mischief follow, right? But it says, but if mischief follow, thou shalt give life for life. Look at what this says right here. Verse 20, shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee, which frameth mischief by a law. They're, using, they're creating a law that allows for this mischief to happen that deserves a death. I mean, this is exactly where we're at today. The United States government has framed mischief by a law by saying it's okay to get an abortion, that it's not against the law. They use their law to allow for wickedness to be done. That's what mischief is. Verse 21, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. And they're doing it through laws. 
condemning the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity, and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. And that's the answer, my friend. Look, we need to have a loud voice. We need to not let these people use this type of rhetoric of just saying, oh yeah, these are skilled professionals. Look, we need to shout from the housetops the word of the Lord and the judgment of God and say this is wickedness that needs to stop and do whatever we can to make it stop. But ultimately, the judgment upon the wickedness of those people is going to rest with God. If we had a righteous government, these people would be taken care of. You know, if, there was, if, if we had righteous police officers, they'd be going in and arresting these people for murder and bringing them down and booking them at the station so they could be held in court and, and, and have a righteous judge preside over them and give them the death penalty for being a mass murderer. But ultimately, we know we live in a fallen world. We know that things aren't perfect. We know that Satan ultimately is the one you know, ruling over this world, which is why we trust in the Lord and we know that the vengeance is going to come from him. These people are going to have, you know, one day, and I believe, I mean, these, these sick, one last point. The women that go down to these, to these abortion clinics, look, most of them are deceived. Most of them don't realize what they're doing. The vast majority of them, I believe that, that they're, you know, they're usually getting talked into this type of a plan and, and other things. And they make a really, really foolish decision. But they're not like a total weirdo reprobate, you know, person that has no hope. Okay? I hope those women get saved. I hope that, that you know, they realize the error of their ways and get right with God and move forward. But the abortion doctor, the one actually performing the procedure that knows what he's doing. See, the women, they don't even see what's going on. They typically don't know ever all the steps involved. They just, they go in, you know, something happens. It may not feel very well, but they don't really know it. The doctor doing those things, the doctor removing the body parts and selling them for a profit, they know what they're doing, and they're a monster. They're going to burn in hell one day, and they're going to get their vengeance from God, and they're going to suffer for all of the lives, the countless innocent blood that they shed. And I don't have any, you know, I believe that those people are beyond hope. If someone, if you're capable, if you're a person that's capable of opening up a womb and chopping up babies and doing that day in and day out as your job, there's something wrong in your head. You're a psychopath. You're a reprobate. God has given you over to do those things. I believe there is no hope for those people to get saved. And I hope they die and burn and go to hell quickly before they could damage any other lives. That's right. Your average person, hey, look, they need to get saved. They need to hear this. They need to get right with God. And we need, as a society in general, to, to, to rebuke this, this murder, this legalized murder. But those, but those wicked, those wicked performers of the abortion would to God that they would just all die and go to hell today. That's Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words of wisdom. God, help us to, to bring your words of wisdom to other people. Help us to, to never back down or to be... Um, or to change our, our mind or our stance on how, on how you feel about this, dear Lord. Help us to, to not be um, toned down at all with this, with this world or desensitized to the, to the wickedness of what's happening in our country, dear Lord. Help us to use our voices to, to make known how wicked those things are and to, and to promote your word, dear Lord, and that um, we can get this people to, to humble themselves, dear Lord, and to, to heed your warnings. God, we love you. We trust that you are a perfect judge. We know that you are. Lord, we thank you for your abundant mercies. 
Lord, we know that, that whatever we've done that's, that's wrong in the past, that, that you, um, you are gracious enough to, to grant us that forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ who paid for our sins. But Lord, we're also aware that there are people out there who are rejected, that you've given up on, that you've given over to a reprobate mind. And Lord, they are malicious. They are evil doers, dear Lord, and we pray that you would please just bring your judgment upon them that they might not harm the, and shed the innocent blood that's been going on so rampantly um, in our world today, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.